As Annie mentioned, I will be presenting the findings from two systematic reviews that, that I've led uh, and discussing their implications for the global response to HIV. Um, one of the reviews examined the evidence on reducing HIV-related stigma and discrimination, and the other examined the effectiveness of human rights programs on influencing HIV outcomes. But before I delve into the details of these reviews, I think it's important to just remind ourselves why stigma and human rights are important to consider, um, both broadly and in the context of HIV. Um, so firstly, stigma is a human rights infringement. So all people have the right to live a life free from discrimination, and we should therefore seek to prevent or minimize the harm caused by it. Um, secondly, stigma has been linked to poor physical and mental health outcomes. And lastly, stigma is often most acute among vulnerable populations who we're trying to reach uh, with our public health efforts. So it definitely gets in the way of, of good health. In the context of HIV, it's important to prevent or mitigate the negative effects of stigma and discrimination because they hamper efforts to prevent new infections and engage people living with HIV in care. Stigma is a documented barrier to HIV testing, serostatus disclosure, retention in care, uptake of and adherence to uh, antiretroviral therapy, and PrEP initiation among adolescent girls. Um, importantly, there's a broad mandate for us to, to re reduce stigma and discrimination. Um, HIV-related stigma reduction is a key priority in PEPFAR's blueprint for achieving an AIDS-free generation and UNAIDS HIV investment framework. And in addition, it's becoming clear that the success of biomedical prevention really hinges upon our ability to foster uptake and regular use of these technologies. And this is likely going to mean that we have to integrate strategies to address stigma um, alongside our efforts to get these new te technologies out to the public. So how does HIV-related stigma operate? We developed this framework to describe the stigmatization process and articulate where interventions are needed. So ideally, we want to stop the process by removing or halting the drivers of stigma. But if that's not possible, then interventions are needed to address the manifestations of stigma. Um, in terms of the things that drive or facilitate stigma, we often think of um, fear of HIV infection through casual transmission, um, negative uh, attitudes and judging attitudes and stereotypes, and facilitators can be things like um, repressive laws or policies. Okay, so now let's take a look at the evidence on the stigma reduction interventions from the first review. So in our systematic review, we identified 48 studies, most of which were assessed to be of high quality, that targeted 14 different populations in 28 countries. The studies spanned a large geographical area, as you can see here, but there are noticeable, there's a noticeable absence of evidence from Eastern Europe and Central Asia. Uh, Ninety percent of the studies reported significant reductions in stigma, and the majority used two or more of the six intervention strategies you see listed here, and the two that are starred were the most commonly used. So I just want to give you a few examples of the types of studies we identified in this review. Um, one study in China reduced prejudicial attitudes and avoidance behavior among healthcare providers with an intervention that combined information-based, skills building, and structural approaches. Uh, specifically, the researchers trained peer opinion leaders to serve as behavior change endorsers and disseminate intervention messages to their coworkers. They also made sure that universal precaution supplies were available at each hospital. Another example um, was a program called the Radio Diaries Program uh, from Malawi, which combined informational and contact strategies to reduce stigma among the general community. Um, the intervention trained, uh, in included training for diarists and producers. Um, and they also had weekly episodes featuring two HIV-positive diarists 
um, and audience call-in sessions. And this kind of intervention is really important because one of the things we've learned from stigma um, reduction research is that one critical component, component is what we call contact strategies. So having contact with a person living with HIV, either in person or, or in this case over the radio, really helps to break down barriers and preconceived notions about what it means to be living with HIV. So in our review, most of the interventions focused on shifting the drivers of stigma, but I'd like to point out here that the diversity and combination of focal areas you see here is really a marked improvement from the last systematic review on stigma reduction interventions that was published in 2002. So we've really come a long way. Individual level interventions were the most common among the studies we we reviewed. So for example, several studies aim to reduce stigmatizing attitudes among students, teachers, or health workers. Um, however, our review demonstrated that the socioecological levels targeted by stigma reduction interventions have expanded now to include all five levels of influence over the past decade. And this is really important as stigma is a social phenomenon that's reinforced by the communities and societies in which we live. So interventions to shift community and societal norms are uh, needed just as much as those to address individual attitudes and behaviors. So what um, does the evidence tell us? We found strong evidence that HIV-related stigma and discrimination can be reduced and a range of interventions ready to be taken to scale. Uh, considerable progress has been made over the last decade. The number, geography, and complexity of interventions has notably expanded. Um, the, a high percentage of studies that showed reductions in HIV-related stigma were of high quality, which is a marked improvement from previous systematic reviews. Um, yet, of course, as always, critical challenges and, and gaps remain uh, that are impeding the identification of effective HIV-related stigma reduction strategies. Um, so there's, there's still work to be done. Uh, current evidence is strongest uh, for interventions with students, healthcare workers, and community members, um, and interventions using structural and counseling-based approaches. So uh, before I move on to talk about the next review, I just want to thank my co-authors on this um, paper and also the funders, uh, which included UNAIDS, um, UK Aid through the STRIVE Research Consortium, and AMFAR. Okay, so moving on to the next review, we now want to take a look at the evidence on human rights programs to improve HIV-related health outcomes. So why are human rights important in the context of HIV? Um, international consensus has now been established on the importance of expanding access to human rights and incorporating principles of a rights-based approach into the HIV response. Um, and a few years ago in 2012, uh, UNAIDS recommended seven key human rights program areas that you see listed here um, that they uh, suggesting people focus on in terms of their human rights programming efforts. In our systematic review, we identified 23 studies, most of which were assessed to be of high quality that targeted 15 different populations in 11 countries. The studies uh, spanned a large geographical area, yet there are clear, um, there are clear gaps in evidence in some regions which you can see here. And I should point out that some of these gaps are in regions where we know that not only is there a, a fairly large HIV epidemic, but there are also um, human rights infringements are, are more common. So 83% of studies reported improvements in HIV-related health outcomes assessed. And the majority addressed two or more of the five UNA's human rights program categories that you see here on the left. And I should just point out that in this particular review, we only looked at five of those UNA's program areas that I listed. We, we did not include the first one, which was on reducing HIV-related stigma because the first review covered that. And we didn't include the last one um, that was more on um, in non-discrimination of women and, and violence. Um, 
so here here you see the ones that were most commonly uh, most commonly reported. So monitoring and reforming laws, policies, and regulations, and sensitizing lawmakers and law enforcement agents were the most commonly combined. Um, outcome measures varied considerably across these studies, which made comparisons between the studies difficult. So unfortunately, I can't tell you which programs or combination of programs worked the best. But I'd like to give you a few examples of the types of human rights programs we identified. So one program in Kenya increased clients' practical knowledge and awareness about how to access legal aid and claim their rights. Um, communicate with healthcare providers, and improve their access to healthcare and justice. In addition, healthcare providers became more adept at identifying human rights violations and other legal difficulties, which enabled them to better support clients. These outcomes were achieved through a combination of interventions that addressed three UNAIDS human rights program categories, including HIV-related legal services and legal literacy, um, that were provided via paralegals situated in health clinics, and training for healthcare providers on human rights and medical ethics related to HIV and GBV. Uh, among the interventions that addressed only one UNAIDS program category, I wanted to point out two examples. One study in Kyrgyzstan reduced intention to confiscate syringes, increased support for referral of drug users to harm reduction services, and increased understanding of sex worker detention program policies among police with a legal literacy training program. Specifically, senior officers received a 46-hour special short course on harm reduction, and new police trainees received shorter modules on the same topic. At the policy level, the introduction of free heart for all people living with HIV in Taiwan in 1997 led to a 53% decrease in, in the rate of HIV transmission and no change in the incidence of syphilis. In our review, uh, most interventions targeted a single sociological level, namely public policy, which you can see here. And the majority of interventions sought to influence two or more attributes of the right to health, namely availability and accessibility. The focus on accessibility is particularly important. Um, as we've heard a lot in, in, um, in at, the, well, at, at present in conferences and the like, um, we've done a really great job scaling up services but not such a great job of supporting key populations to access these services. So evidence-based interventions to increase accessibility are really critical for achieving global goals. I do want to point out that only a few of these studies explicitly referenced using a human rights-based approach in the intervention design, implementation, or evaluation. So this really needs to change uh, moving forward. So what uh, does the evidence tell us? Since the UN um, adoption of, human, of the human rights-based approach in 2003, human rights programs to improve HIV-related health outcomes um, have certainly evolved. Um, there's a diversity of approaches now being employed. Uh, we, we found good evidence that human rights programs can improve HIV-related health outcomes and a range of promising interventions, some that are scalable and others with room for improvement. Um, but efforts to evaluate the individual and public health benefits of these programs have not kept pace, um, leaving critical questions for implementation and scale up at local, state, and national levels. So a few important cautions um, for human rights programs um, that I wanted to point out. Um, firstly, laws intended to protect key populations, if incomplete or not accompanied by proper enforcement, can be harmful or ineffective. For example, one study compared counties in California that had legalized syringe exchange programs with those who had not. It turned out that arrests of injection drug users and citations for drug paraphernalia actually increased in the areas where syringe exchange programs were legalized. 
this was because police targeted people coming for clean syringes, and they were able to do this because carrying syringes and drug use were still criminalized. Another uh, pitfall um, that uh, we found in the review is only focusing on changing structures without also focusing on individuals. So for example, a multi-state study of locally identified structural changes within institutions like homeless shelters and schools reported no significant effect on reductions of sexual risk behavior among at-risk teens in the U.S. And I think this is a challenge um, for human rights programs across the board is really finding the right mix of what sociological levels um, do you need to target um, and, and um, just understanding that in addition to focusing on laws and policies, it's also really important to focus on individuals and, and vice versa. So um, in closing um, out the discussion of these reviews, I just want to review a few key things. So um, we, firstly, we know that the effectiveness of biomedical prevention technologies like universal testing and treatment and pre-exposure um, pre prophylaxis depend heavily on the comfort and willingness of key populations to engage in the healthcare system and accept and use these products and services. Um, all of the scientific advances in treatment and biomedical prevention over the last decade will really be for naught unless we can reach um, these populations, which at the AIDS conference um, <laughs> seem to be a term the 10-10-10. Um, so it's really important that we think about um, focusing on how we access these populations. So programs and policies to remove the human rights barriers to engagement in prevention, care, and treatment um, are really urgently needed. So as we've um, discussed here today, uh, there are promising approaches ready to be taken to scale now, um, but more funding is really required to develop and rigorously evaluate additional approaches to ensure that human rights are really front and center in a comprehensive response to HIV. And it's really only, um, only when we're able to uphold human rights for all um, that we'll be successful at achieving an AIDS-free generation. So I'd just like to um, thank, uh, to acknowledge my co-authors on this uh, paper and also to thank um, the funders that you see listed here for their generous support. So again, UNAIDS supported this review along with the Open Society Foundations and UK Aid through the STRIVE Research Consortium that enabled this research. So I know that was a, a quick review of the, of the two reviews, so I'm hoping that we can have a, a rich discussion and um, talk more um, about any questions you may have. And that was really interesting. Thank you so much. that Maria Zermond has her hand raised. Hi. Um, I worked a lot on HIV, but increasingly working in disability where stigma is also huge. And mm -hmm. I just wondered when you did your systematic review, whether you, um, perhaps it's a separate paper or perhaps it's in there. I mean, how were people you know, evaluating the fact that stigma was being reduced? And were there any particular things that jumped out as interesting tools or interesting approaches? Um, I know that wasn't the aim of the systematic review, but I just wonder whether that's something that's that's come out of that work. Yeah, uh, no, thank you um, for, for the question. I think um, definitely uh, there, there are a lot of different ways in which people measure um, the stigma, and I, this was one of the things that um, I, I probably should have pointed out when I talked about the challenges that were, that became evident in the review is that everyone seems to measure stigma a little bit differently. So that is a bit of a challenge. We weren't able to do a meta-synthesis, for example, or, or a meta-analysis, sorry, um, because people tend to measure stigma in different ways. Um, so for example, they may just measure discriminatory attitudes before and after an intervention, and if they see a decrease, say like, okay, great, you know, we've reduced stigma. Um, but one of the things that we have really been advocating for, and one of the reasons why we develop that framework that you saw at the beginning is because we really um, want people to be more intentional with their measures and make sure that they're capturing the specific 
drivers and manifestations that they want to see change in. So um, I, I have a whole separate presentation on stigma measurement, which I think actually might be an old uh, learning lab from several, several years ago, and, I, and I'm happy to, to share resources. But typically people were um, having some sort of instrument, sometimes a validated instrument, um, sometimes not, uh, that, they, that they were measuring pre and post. And also lots of times people used qualitative um, interviews and, and things like that to to understand how their programs were were influencing change. Um, so does that does that help to answer your question? Yeah, it does. I might follow you up to get your uh, other presentation, but that's great. Thank you. Sure. There's another question here from Tara Beatty, who says, mm -hmm. "Thanks for a really interesting summary. Can you explain what ten 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 means?" Yes, um, sure. So um, I, I'm sure many people um, are familiar with um, UNAID's 90-90-90 targets. Um, so basically, uh, hold on, I'm trying to quickly pull them up so I don't don't tell them to you um, uh, incorrectly. Um, so basically, the 90-90-90 the, the targets um, were the, the plan put forward to help end the AIDS epidemic. Um, and so at the, at the AIDS conference in, um, in Durban last year, a few speakers um, started talking about the 10-10-10. So it's like it's great that we can reach the 90-90-90, but if we're not actually reaching those most, most at risk, the key populations, then we're still not going to be able to get very far in ending the HIV epidemic. Um, so that, that's why I added in the 10-10-10. That helps. That's great. I wanted to ask you, I think what's really interesting about a lot of this work is the link between the research and what it means in the real world in terms of policies and programs. And I was interested particularly in the work on vulnerable, most vulnerable populations. And I wondered if you could give some examples and also to think about some of the challenges at the moment, particularly with the transfer to domestic national domestic funding for HIV prevention and where that's where there is the danger of specific vulnerable populations being um, not receiving the kind of attention and support they might need. Yeah, so just a quick clarifying question. So do you, in terms of the, the key population programs, you're meaning specific interventions from the reviews or? Yes, you spoke in the, in the first review about the importance of reaching most vulnerable populations. Um, and I wondered if you could just specify, talk a bit specifically about which are the most significant ones. Yeah, I mean, I think it um, it, it obviously depends on on your context in terms of which which key populations um, are most important to target. I think right. in terms of stigma reduction interventions, what we've seen most um, in terms of the 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 majority of the literature is really more at the individual level with healthcare workers, with students, um, with frankly the populations that are a bit uh, easier to reach. Um, in terms of what's happened on the key population side, um, typically there, there hasn't been as much stigma reduction uh, research. The human rights programs um, that I presented uh, do a better job because I think they're, they're very much focused at a structural level, looking at laws and policies, harm reduction policies, um, for drug users, um, like I was mentioning, I didn't, we didn't find anything on sex work or sex workers in terms of human rights programs, which is obviously an important um, gap. Um, and I think one, one area that might not necessarily be a population that's not really considered a key population, but adolescent girls in southern Africa, um, there's, there's in recent years kind of it's been becoming obvious that um, these young women are having challenges. Um, adopting prevention technologies, and so I, I think there are some new stigmas emerging around those technologies. So um, there's some interesting work starting to look at prep, prep stigma and stigma towards some of these technologies and how what we can do to sort of help LA fears that these product and that and prevent these products from being associated with stigma, but also to help young women feel comfortable um, using these products. Um, and protecting their health. 
so um, th- that's just off the top of my head, uh, you know, the, some, some examples of the kinds of programs. In terms of your other question, I think it's, it's particularly important, and I think we're all really worried about this, because with the way um, around the world we're seeing this sort of kind of trend towards, um, you know, <laughs> nationalism and also negative um, outpouring and feelings towards, you know, our most vulnerable, really, our immigrants um, and, you know, gay populations, LGBTI populations, transgender individuals. Um, these are exactly the people that we need to reach, and these are exactly the people that are very much at risk of HIV and, and of course, many other diseases. And so um, I think I'm certainly worried, and I think a lot of people are very worried, but I, I can say that a lot of the foundations, um, especially the foundations in the U.S. that I'm familiar with are really aware of this and, and uh, tend to step up to try and help um, fill that gap. Um, I know the funders concerned about AIDS have a special group and have a, a special meeting on specifically focusing on these populations around the world. So I do think that there are funders that are willing to support, but in terms of large funders, uh, you know, like Cutfar and, and um, USAID, we I guess we'll sort of have to wait and see what see what happens. And others That's on the great. phone, I know there's some people from UNAIDS. I see might want to comment on that as well. We have a couple more questions, which is great. Carol Ballantyne asks, looking at the individual level, do you make a distinction between targeting stigmatized people and members of the wider population? In other words, between individual experiences of internal stigma and individual stigmatizing attitudes and behaviors? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, you really need to do both things. So um, when I was talking about the framework, I had mentioned that I, you know, ideally we want to stop stigma from happening. So we want to remove those drivers. We want to improve laws that protect against discrimination. Um, and there's a lot of good work happening to do that. But ultimately, I think many people will still be stigmatized and still be discriminated against. So we also need programs in place to help support those individuals who are experiencing stigma. So you really need you really need interventions at both levels. And I think what typically happens is it's much easier to intervene at the individual level. Um, so most of the interventions that you see with people living with HIV are really support-based, you know, support groups, counseling to overcome or, or help to deal with internal and internalized stigma. Um, but, you know, and obviously on the human rights side, there's a lot of activism. There's a lot of people living with HIV who are very, very involved in the process. And, and sort of through that, um, there, are, there, there are interventions like the PLHIV Stigma Index, which are meant to be sort of empowering both measurement tools, but also empowering interventions that help people really um, sort of overcome uh, the stigma that they're facing and, and become resilient and, and help others to, to do the same. Uh, so it really depends on your context and what you think is the most pressing problem and also on your, on your funding that you have available. So that's part of the challenge with, with stigma work and human rights work is that it's, there's not a, a lot of funding out there. Um, and funders also, they want something, um, they want to fund something that's measurable. So it's much easier to measure individual change, for example, than waiting 10 years to see if this great policy that put, got put in place actually has an influence. Um, so I guess my answer is that you really need to do both, and there's a lot of different strategies out there that have, um, you know, that work at these different levels. Um, and if you can, it's best to try and mix and do individual and community and structural level interventions at the same time. We, um, I would like to emphasize Anne's invitation to those from UNAIDS and other bodies if you have any comments to make as we go along. That would be great. Meanwhile, I have, um, we have a question typed in from Hope Carpenter, who's in a library and can't speak out loud at the moment. <laughs> she wants to ask, um, there was a similar framework developed by the National AIDS Trust in the UK. It also included power structures as a domain. I would like to ask why this is not ex explicitly included. And she's given a link there. As Anne is based in the US, I'm not sure she will know this publication, but maybe that's something you do know about, Anne. 
I don't actually. So I'm 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 clicking on the link, and I I, I will I will look at it. Um, I think uh, this framework emerged from work that we started. I think it was back in 2009 with support from UNAIDS. And so the purpose of the framework was to very much be as practical as possible. So you'll see a lot of stigma frameworks that are very um, conceptual and looking at all the different things that might possibly influence. And what we were trying to hone in on is what we call actionable drivers and facilitators, the things we can actually shift through intervention. And the, and the version of the, the framework that you see is really the overall general one that doesn't really spell out what, what actually goes into each of those categories. So I would say that power structures, which really, you know, that kind of comes from the work of both Lincoln Phelan um, and Parker and Appleton in, in some of their work, uh, you know, we know that there are these underlying power structures and, and inequalities that are driving the stigmatization process. And where we um, encompass those in our framework is in facilitators. Um, so facilitators, in our view, are things that either um, help to prevent stigma or they can actually fuel stigma. So it could be something like a harmful law. It could be, um, you know, that, that's put in place. Um, you know, if you have a very conservative government, uh, for, for example, or it could be a very supportive uh, anti-discrimination policy or something like a government decides to, that, you know, to provide free access to ART for everyone. So I would say that where the power structures would fall within, um, within our framework are really under the facilitators, but we really focus on the, um, the things that are actionable. Um, so, and I think power is sort of a bit of an amorphous concept that it might be hard to sort of target with an intervention. Um, however, for example, like we've done interventions before in Vietnam with the, the, the Communist Party um, to help uh, leaders understand why this is very important. And then through that work with individuals in the national government, that, that kind of opened up doors to being able to work in communities and with individuals and with people living with HIV. So uh, there, there are ways to address power, but I think um, we, didn't, we didn't necessarily call it out um, specifically in the model. Great. Um, and Hope responds, thanks a lot, that makes sense. I hope everyone can see the paper that Hope was mentioning. I'll just put the link into the chat box in case you can't see it, but I think you probably can. Um, I wanted to ask you, Anne, particularly looking at structural interventions in meetings I've been in, people often raise the, the question of decriminalization. Obviously, there have been significant efforts in m many different countries to decriminalize sex work and to decriminalize mm -hmm. um, men having sex with men. Um, and I wondered what the evidence says about that, taking into account your point that unless things are, um, in, in, unless new regulations and new laws aren't thoroughly enforced and well enforced and people aren't aware of them, they have limited impact. But I just wondered if that claim that decriminalization is one of the strongest um, possible effort, you know, most effective mm -hmm. ways to structural ways to um, reduce stigma and therefore HIV risk, what, what the evidence yeah. says about that. Yeah, well, one of the interventions included in the human rights, the review of human rights programs was actually right. a program in Senegal a number of years ago. I, I feel like it was in the, the 80s or 90s. It was a long time ago that, um, but that they, they decriminalized sex work. Um, and they had they put in place this program where sex workers um, had to sort of register, um, and then they were able to receive free services um, and STI treatment and all of this. And they they did a um, they looked kind of at data over time, um, and it definitely had a really um, important impact on health outcomes for sex workers. But the challenge. Um, that with with it is that they they really didn't um, they really didn't take into account and they really didn't monitor what this program what the effect of this program on on was on sex workers 
So I think this is a, a, a real challenge with some of these is that um, you're, you're, you're putting in a beneficial, what's assumed to be a beneficial program or policy, and it can definitely have positive health outcomes. But what does it mean for those individuals and their human rights? I mean, now you have all these sex workers who, for example, have to register with the national government, and we don't know what, what might be the ramifications of that for those women who, you know, that, that that kind of thing wasn't measured. So that's just one caution that I think when we see these studies about these big policies or decriminalization that are, are really important to consider is really the hum, all of the sort of human rights aspects of that and what that means for populations. And I think that's just something that can be um, addressed through better, better measurement um, when we're studying these issues. Um, I think that, like I was pointing out that example in California, there's definitely mixed, um, it's, it's when you legalize some things without legalizing others, like, you know, syringe exchange but not carrying more than three syringes, it's, it's complicated. So I think, and, and, it, and it, it can actually lead to increased harm for, for your populations that you're trying really hard to protect. So I think it's just, um, in my view, it probably comes down to sort of educating a lot of the policymakers when they're when they're putting these policies in place and kind of getting this evidence to them that sort of shows you you can't really do this um, in a piecemeal way. Um, you have to really think about all these different pieces and put them all together in your legislation. Now, I mean, I know that that that's difficult because legislation usually happens in in small pieces that are added on and and tested out, but um, you know, I, I think I think we just need um, need more data. I mean, we have very little in terms of of what what happens, and we do have. There's a recent study um, that uh, Steph Baral um, that they they came out with because there was that when they were they had a separate program going on. I think it was in Senegal um, with with gay men uh, and men who have sex with men, and they during the middle of their program, that's when was it Senegal or Nigeria? I can't, I can't remember the country, but the country sort of um, uh, made it, you know, criminalized, criminalized same-sex behavior. And they literally were able to see a significant reduction in MSM coming in for services because they happened to have this study going on when this law was put in place. So I think we definitely have, have decent evidence that these policies are harmful and they really are reducing access to services for key populations. Um, but it would be better if we had more studies and, and preferably more studies um, showing the opposite thing, <laughs> where we decriminalize and then we look over over time at, at how that influences influences the situation for key populations. That's really interesting. I think that'd be great to send out some links to those those studies. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what I found it particularly interesting what you said about not doing some kind of piecemeal one factor intervention and rather seeing it in a more holistic way and going to I think it was Hope's point about power structures that um, when we see structural interventions from the supply side the supply of laws and new legislation we can also look at it structural interventions from the demand side about for instance some of the work our colleagues have done in India with sex worker collectives so that mm -hmm. we're um, increasing the capacity and the empowerment, if you like, of, of um, key populations to take up and protect each other and themselves in, in contexts where, where features of their own lives and behaviors are stigmatized as well. Mm -hmm. So I think that's also quite an interesting structural um, level of discussion is this is the demand side and the capacity of, of key populations to demand and take up on take up some of those um, mm -hmm. new laws and so on. I think that would be really interesting. We have another question yeah. here from Abisola Balogun asking and I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, is there any evidence in your reviews to show the influence of religion on stigma? Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks for that question. Um, we we didn't actually identify any intervention studies um, that looked at this specific question, um, and and actually, I don't think any of the studies in either of the reviews um, targeted uh, religious leaders or religious organizations um, 
with their interventions. I can tell you from other work that ICRW has done um, uh, with uh, faith-based organizations that there, there is a lot of programmatic work happening. Um, I, I don't think it's being well evaluated, um, which is why it didn't show up in the, in the systematic review. Um, religion is a little bit tricky because I think it can definitely go either way. Um, I think we all know of examples of religious leaders, you know, telling people to stop taking their ART um, and, and having that kind of a negative influence and, and kind of pushing the shame and the blame and, and that. But there's equally a, a number of examples showing how positive, supportive, um, uh, religious institutions and faith-based organizations, the, how, what kind of a positive effect that can have on individuals. Um, specifically, I can tell you about some programs. Um, ICRW and, and partners came up with a, a stigma reduction toolkit um, that's been used all over the world and I think it's at least over 50 countries now. And one of those countries was Afghanistan and they actually um, with some support from the World Bank a number of years ago, I think it was 2009 or so, there's a, actually a book um, that we put out that, that talks about the results of this, but they actually adapted some of those um, lessons from the Stigma Reduction Toolkit and they worked with the, the Ministry of the Hajj um, and Religious Affairs um, to, to be able to share this and get, they got approval to share this tra these um, sort of lessons with uh, mullahs. And, and then those mullahs were able to go out and integrate those stigma reduction um, lessons into their um, you know, weekly prayers and into those, those sorts of things. And um, that, uh, uh, that um, intervention actually showed very promising results. Unfortunately, it's not, it was, it, it was simply, it was a, we didn't, there wasn't a lot of money and so it wasn't fully evaluated. Um, but I do know from qualitative work and um, you know, program monitoring that the organization um, collected, that that really seemed to be a good way to influence people. Um, so I, I think part of the reason we don't, we're not seeing the evidence is that there's just not a lot of funding to evaluate these interventions. But it's a really good point because religion is obviously one of those things I would put in the facilitator category. It can be helpful or it can be harmful and we have to figure out a way to, um, to minimize the harmful. That's great. It's a really important point. Um, there's a um, contribution from Emma Fielding. She's asking if we're aware of a recent Lancet article on the decriminalization of sex work. And that's in, um, if you look up the lancet.com series, HIV and sex workers, which I think is an, obviously an important contribution to this thinking here. Link and the section, the page on our Strive website do give you the link to um, Anne and her colleagues' systematic review of HIV stigma. But their, um, her, the systematic review of human rights interventions, and correct me if I'm wrong, hasn't yet been published, but is forthcoming. Am I right? Yeah, yeah, it's under review. So it's under cross review. your fingers. I <laughs> hopefully it'll come out sometime this year. We will be, um, obviously, if that comes out, well, as soon as that comes out, we will be um, providing a link and we will include it in our monthly digest of resources. I hope everyone has signed up for that. You can find the link on any of our website pages, both to invitations to the Learning Labs and to um, our monthly digest of related resources to this whole field of study and action. So if and there's nothing... Yeah, Just to add, Annie, um, the, the Strive website definitely has all of the, the, the stigma resources that um, we have been generated um, with support from Strive, but it's some of the other things I mentioned, like the Stigma Reduction Toolkit and the book that the World Bank put out um, about some of the stigma reduction interventions in South Asia, all of that is available on the ICRW um, website, which is just www.icrw.org. And if you go into the publication section and type stigma, all of those publications will come up. You can also access Great. them there. We have a question, a last question from Hope Carpenter. She's specifically studying the phenomenon in Swaziland. Mm. Do you know of any high, high quality or recent studies based in that area, in that country or nearby? Um, 
don't know of any recent stuff, but I do know um, there's a lot of great people working on the, the issue there. Um, I think EggPass um, has done some work. Um, also, um, the CDC office uh, in Swaziland is, is super supportive of this kind of work. Um, and I'm trying to think. I, I don't, I don't know of any specific resources off the top of my head, but it's definitely an area where there's there's um, active networks of people living with HIV, um, and I, I know there have been some efforts um, at the national level to try and um, try and reduce stigma. So it's, I think that's a great context for you to be working in. Wonderful. So hope we do hope you'll keep hope we do hope you'll keep us informed about. <laughs> your own work in this field and um, uh, so that we can also make that available to the wider Strive network. And Stangl, thank you so much for sharing this. It's a huge body of work. It's a huge, they're both really enormous reviews. And I'm sure that people on the call and more widely will have, will gain a great deal from these resources. So thanks so much. Um, and thanks to everyone for sure. joining us. Oh, here's the oh, last one. Question. Annabelle Clark, <laughs> have you looked into the links between interlinks between stigma related to sexuality or sexual identity and HIV? Yes. Um, so this is a great question. Um, um, one of the things I didn't talk about today um, was something we call intersecting stigma. It's often called layered stigma. Um, or it has been called layered stigma in the past, and this is just the phenomenon that people um, may be experiencing stigma for m multiple different reasons. It could be because they're a sex worker or be because of their gender identity, because they're a poor woman, um, and also because of a, um, a disease like having HIV. Um, so this is a, an area that a lot of stigma researchers are grappling with across a lot of different um, fields and, and diseases, and uh, honestly, I can tell you we haven't really done a great job of um, measuring, of figuring out a way to measure um, and look at the relationships between, like is one more important than the other? If you reduce one, will you reduce the other? So that's really an area of emerging um, work, uh, but I can tell you that we just put out a paper with um, Steph Brawl and his team, um, actually, you know, it may it, it may not be. It, it's it's been accepted, and it may be coming out as an EPUB. It might might not be out yet. But we actually um, are. It's a paper on um, sexual um, sexual stigma or sexual behavior stigma. So um, I stay tuned for that, um, and that should be coming out very soon. And that and there's some the Hopkins team, um, and through the Mesh Consortium that is headed by the LSHTM. If you're familiar with that, they're doing some work on um, uh, sexual uh, behavior stigma. So just kind of stay tuned um, for that work. Great. Um, I think we'll probably leave it at that. And Stangle, thanks so much.